Hello and welcome to the Hour of History podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Bauman, and this week we are turning back the clock for a much anticipated and long awaited episode on ancient history. I'm talking ancient Rome and the cost of war with Dr. Brett Devereaux. It's a fascinating conversation that shows just how much goes into being a historian of ancient Rome and a soldier in the Roman Republic. It's a fascinating conversation. I hope you'll enjoy and check out all the great links at hourofhistory.com so you can learn more about ancient history. Because on Hour of History, it's our world anytime, any place. Enjoy. You're listening to the Hour of History podcast. Our world. Anytime, any place. For show notes, links, and more, be sure to visit our website at www.ourofhistory.com. And for all the book recommendations made during the podcast, head over to ourofhistory.com forward slash rex. That's ourofhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. Without further delay, your Hour of History starts right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hour of History. With me, I have Dr. Brett Devereaux. Hello. Hey. (laughs) <laughs> How are you doing? I'm so excited to finally have someone on the show to talk about history that didn't happen within the last thousand years. Well, I'm excited to be here and talk about history that definitely didn't happen in the last thousand years. You know, uh, I'm going to start this with like sort of a, a, a self, I don't always do this anecdote, but um, and when I was teaching in New York City, there came down a rule from on high that the test was going to be after 1750 the the regents exam and you know that begs the question of when does history start because a lot of times when you get rid of the test unfortunately you get rid of the material and the sort of ancient history uh started to fade away pretty quickly so i hopefully in this conversation you can tell us a little bit about why that's such a bad thing but first let's start with the good things uh who are you and and how'd you get into rome (laughs) uh right so uh i am Brett Devereaux. I have my PhD out of the Department of History at UNC Chapel Hill. I have a master's in classics out of Florida State. That kind of uh, one, two degree structure is not uncommon. Um, I study intersections between the uh, Roman army and the Roman economy, and both in the sense of how does one get a Roman empire and what does it mean that one has a Roman empire, as it were. Hmm. And so how, how did you sort of come to Rome? And I guess you started with classics in, in your master's. What was the uh, initial sort of attraction? So I fell into it actually somewhat earlier than that. Uh, I was lucky. My high school was one of the few that still offers Latin at the high school hmm. level. And I decided to take that because I thought it would be cool. And I was vaguely aware that I wouldn't be required to speak it. (laughs) Um, And so I I took Latin at the high school level. Uh, I continued taking some Latin in college. The thing about Latin instruction that I think may catch people off guard if they're not familiar with how it works is that you often move into reading what is essentially high literature and, you know, for the historians, primary sources very rapidly with Latin instruction or ancient Greek instruction, sometimes inside of the first year. Mm -hmm. So even taking Latin in high school by year three, we were reading Cicero giving politically charged speeches in the Senate. You end up, immersed in the culture, in the way of viewing the world very rapidly in a way that you might not taking, for instance, French or German. Yeah, I I always thought taking those initial language courses where the dialogue is sort of, hi, will you be my friend? You know, it gets a bit tedious, but uh, in, in Latin, you don't have that. But it's, it's not so easy in the way that you can't go online and sort of listen to a Latin podcast. Um, no, so, although there are a couple of living Latin radio stations around the world that broadcast in Latin. They do exist. Oh, so uh, it's, it, it, even that is becoming more possible in this day and age. But, it but it was the classics then that sort of drew you in? Well, 
I, I took Latin in high school. I got to college essentially knowing I wanted to be some sort of professional historian. I just didn't know what I wanted to study. And I think the exposure to Latin sort of caused me to continually gravitate towards the ancient world. I, I found myself drawn towards questions of empire and, and what empires were successful and what success means for an empire. How does one judge the success or failure of an empire? Uh, is, is it judged by the impact it has on the people who rule it? Or as I would argue, the impact it has on the people who are ruled by it. And I found myself drawn to Rome because it has this reputation for tremendous success. This is an empire that the people it subjugated would, in its closing centuries, fight desperately against its collapse. And their descendants would, in turn, spend generations trying to recreate it or reinvent it. And that struck me as truly incredible. Of course, a lot of that nice shiny sheen wears off on close closer inspection the romans were not teddy bears they could be pretty nasty fellows hmm. but there is that sort of uh that that movement towards all looking back to the romans at least in the western uh philosophical tradition uh it kind of means that if you're learning these things in latin you should also have a good pairing with modern european history as well was that the case for you yeah i've i generally I branched out fairly widely. I like to branch out very widely. Of course, the other field I work in is military history, and mm -hmm. military history strongly encourages you to think across time periods. It has as its central conceit the idea that knowing something about how people fought in the past can tell you something about how people will fight now. Hmm. And so it encourages that kind of, of broad approach. And I do think that there is a sort of uh, continuing relevance of the of the classical Greek and Roman tradition. It certainly continues to suffuse our political institutions. Yeah, and you have already mentioned that you were kind of lucky to have this Latin available in high school. I'm, I'm thinking back just quickly over my own undergraduate and graduate experience, and it seems like uh, courses on ancient Rome were, were few and far between. It varies university to university. I think the classics, even more so than history departments, has been in a sort of bitter and sometimes losing rearguard action against efforts to shrink its footprint in, in the university. Uh, the sort of funding battles hmm. uh, have definitely come to classics departments. Also anthropology and archeology span departments, which as I'm guessing we'll talk about are closely <laughs> connected. Um, and so, uh, so its footprint has, has decreased. And that's something certainly that uh, classicists tend to be very aware of. Hmm. Though in some cases, I think it's because it's new to the field. If you read the very first historians, if you read Herodotus and Thucydides, at least the first historians in the Greek tradition, they are aware of the need to defend the legitimacy of what they're doing from the very beginning. So history as a field has been defending its existence for 2,400 years and has assumed that it will need to continue doing so. Classics has never had that burden, and so they're having to learn now, because even 50 years ago, it was self-evident why you would want to study Cicero. Hmm. Now they have to make the argument. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I'm thinking back to my theory classes, and we certainly didn't start with uh, Thucydides or Herodotus. Um, you know, is that a is that a problem that hi you think uh, history departments should change? Should uh, historians of, say, the 20th century still be visiting these, you know, ancient historians? I think a lot of modern historians would be surprised by particularly Thucydides and also perhaps Polybius, some of these ancient historians, at how sophisticated they are. Thucydides does not feel like a sort of first draft undergraduate approach to history. He knows his business. He is very sophisticated in his analysis. He is intentional and sometimes quite penetrating in how he views society. He's also uh, very good at, at catching you unawares and slipping things past you because he's really very smart. Hmm. And he has an argument he is making 
and is willing to not lie to you, but bend facts to make his argument. <laughs> and I, I think that experience would be valuable. Uh, this is one of the oddities of studying the ancient world is that you often have your primary sources who may still be a hundred years after events are often asking the same questions as you are. Hmm. I, this is one of the reasons I, I really enjoy the podcast is because it makes me reevaluate my approach, you know, even thinking about like the first introductory lessons, it's, it's so easy to forget some of the stuff that's way before. Um, one of the things you mentioned just there was the, this span of years and years, hundreds of years, um, your dissertation l looked at, you know, like you mentioned, the, the economic, um, military, uh, big scope and a big time period. Um, could you explain a little bit about what your dissertation was and, and how you sort of had to f face a huge time period? <laughs> So my dissertation examined the cost of warfare during what we would call the Middle Republic. Specifically, the, this is the initial phase of Roman expansion beyond Italy. Uh, my date brackets were 264 to 101 BCE. Uh, that long time frame, in part, was because I wanted to look at the whole process, but in part, it is... Uh, an accident of, or a result of, an accident is perhaps the wrong term, but is a result of the evidence that oftentimes the date brackets in the study of the ancient world can get wider because you can't do a detailed summary of one month in, say, 263 BC. Everything we know about 263 BC could fit in a single typed page <laughs> because the sources get really thin on the ground. Uh, I ended up using a mix of uh, comparative evidence, demographic modeling, material culture, and of course, close reading of what literary primary sources do exist. Uh, I should note that, that classes tend to use the phrase the literary sources because almost all of our texts come in the form of what is essentially high literature exceptions we can talk about. So we tend to call them the literary sources, but that's it, 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 not all poems. Hmm. Um, yeah. It, so this question of evidence then is is very different. I remember in my talk, like you mentioned uh, earlier, with uh, Courtney Conchu about the Anglo-Saxons. She mentioned that she kind of had to be more than a literary historian, looking at a, a variety of things. What what is some of that material culture and uh, sources outside of the literary works that you look drew upon? Right. So the, just to give people who are more familiar with the abundance of texts that you get for later historical periods, uh, one of the classics departments I was in, this is just an illustration, uh, but a valuable one, they had the complete Loeb Library, which is, a, is uh, that's Harvard University Presses now, uh, Greek and Latin texts. They're in little green and red volumes. They're very distinctive. And at this point, functionally, the entire corpus of ancient literature has been published in that volume. And they had it in two five-foot-tall bookshelves, one right next to the other. So it was about a five-foot-tall by maybe 10, 12-foot wide space. And that is functionally the entire corpus of <laughs> texts. If you wanted to add all of the inscriptions, graffiti uh, that's published, you could perhaps double that adding your SEG and uh, CIL volumes and so on. These are in inscriptions. Um, and that's it. That's what you have to work with. This is, it is a closed corpus. It isn't every couple of decades we might find something new, but not likely. So you have to get really clever in hmm. how you ask your historical questions and how you answer them. Obviously, one thing that you do is you read your sources much more intensively. I think that's part of why there's very, the tendency of ancient historians to move through classics departments. You have to be a language expert when everything that was written at the time about the social institution you're investigating, when all of what you have is a few dozen lines by a couple of authors, you better read those lines very carefully. 
but it also means looking outside of traditional literary texts. Uh, I mentioned you can have different kinds of texts, uh, inscription evidence, the Greeks and the Romans in particular love inscribing laws and pronouncements and eulogies on stone. And so we'll turn those up, but they are often difficult to work with. You have specialists that work with them, but sometimes really amazing information. Egypt turns up a wealth of papyri with writing on them of mixed value. And you're often talking about the equivalent of, if you imagine, say, like a, you have a passport application form and you imagine you're missing about two thirds of it roughly randomly distributed and you have kind of a roughly, you know, sort of oblong shaped bit in the middle. Can you reconstruct the entire form from that? And this is what epigraphers are often doing. Hmm. What can we, what can we reconstruct from what we have? Hmm. And so <laughs> this already sounds like a, a daunting challenge. Um, it's very interdisciplinary. Uh, I think almost all, almost all ancient historians are doing some kind of work I would define as, as interdisciplinary. Obviously, I do material culture, hmm. mostly. And, and it's not just interdisciplinary, but it, it also, I mean, it's, it's like fourth dimensional with the expertise of language that you have to have. Um, or was that something you learned along the way? How, how good was your Latin when you started engaging and re-engaging in these texts? Your Latin, by the, time you show, uh, by the time you show up for graduate work, the expectation is going to be that you can read your primary sources in Latin and Greek. Hmm. I took a year between my undergraduate and beginning my graduate career in a post-baccalaureate program at Georgetown to shore up my Greek. Hmm. So the, the expectation is that that is pretty much on lockdown. You will continue to take graduate level language courses through, through the graduate career, but this is something you're just expected to have for better and for worse. I think sometimes hmm. that perhaps excludes people who could do valuable work in the field. And I'm wondering if that's sort of a, well, it's probably a, a larger issue with the field, right? You, you, if you can't access the materials or if there's such a high sort of entry level knowledge you have to have it, it, um, it makes it very hard to access, like you said. Um, does that change how you sort of approach things? Um, I, I was looking through your dissertation and, and, you know, it's, it's, it is massive. There's a ton of information in there. Um, did you feel like a sort of burden to have to do that, to really engage? So the dissertation scope grew as I went. It was not originally intended to be, what is it, 688? <laughs> I think there's something ridiculous like that. It was not originally intended to be that massive. I set out an investigative goal, which you can talk about what I was aiming to do, but it was then sort of, what does it take to get there? And in some cases, I had assumed at the beginning that the evidence that I would be gathering, much of that, much of that road would be paved in front of me, and I found it wasn't, mm. and decided to pave it myself. <laughs> this was perhaps a poor decision, but I, in the end, it, it produced a, a pretty good dissertation. I guess to backfill that with what I was doing, uh, the major limitation for talking about the cost of warfare in the Roman world in general is the near complete absence of price data. What, you know, if you want to talk about the cost of the American war effort in the Second World War, you have an advantage is that you have the recorded prices of all of these things. You know how much the army was paying for a Sherman tank. Hmm. We have within a rounding error of no prices for military equipment from any period of classical antiquity. <laughs> so there was never any hope of reducing these costs to a money value and comparing. So what I decided to do was instead talk about them in terms of resources. I discussed the full range of costs, pay, food, supplies, equipment. I spend most of the time on equipment because it required the most work. And instead of trying to make a dollar value or denarius value comparison of, say, soldier A to soldier B in terms of cost, I could compare the resources and labor required. And that meant using material culture. It meant 
looking at recovered examples of each type of equipment one by one to determine the total amount of wood, leather, textile, and metal that each soldier is carrying. <laughs> and then because that information is functionally meaningless without some kind of comparative benchmark, I then went and did it for all of Rome's rivals, both the great states of the Eastern Mediterranean, like the Seleucid Empire or Antigonid Macedonia, for Carthage as much as the evidence permits, which isn't very far, but also for non-state peoples, uh, Gallic warriors, pre-Roman Spain, and that kind of thing. The database of artifacts includes about 400 of them. Hmm. And like you said, because you have 400, a sort of finite amount, um, you're going into great detail with some of these artifacts. Can you give us an example of, of some of the materials that you looked at and what conclusions you were able to draw from that? So I looked at, I looked at a wide range of materials and you often have a lot of sort of difficulty in different sorts of problems. So on the one end, you might have a category of, of object where the number of examples is extremely few. Uh, this was the case, for instance, for the Macedonian pike, the Sarissa. We have a couple of these. Uh, what I should say is that we have a couple of the tips and butts of these. The wood is gone. So what you have is you have a spear point and then 21 feet on the other side of the room, you have the spear butt. <laughs> uh, these were pikes. They were very long. And it's from that, can you reconstruct the weapon? And so that was a question of how much can you get out of a very small corpus of objects? In other cases, uh, the situation uh, could be worse. Uh, we know from our literary sources that the primary Roman body armor during this period was chainmail. <laughs> I generally, I just say mail. Chain mail is a, not a great way of phrasing, but it's what people know. Mm -hmm. uh, and the amount of recovered mail, Roman mail from this period is very, 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 very small. Too small to generalize from. And then it becomes a question of comparative evidence. Can mm -hmm. I look at how this armor is represented in artwork? Again, you're looking at a single digit number of representations to work from, so you better use them well. Uh, can I look at how it is discussed in our sources? Can I look at what it looks like in other later periods where it's better documented, where I have more evidence? And from that, can I reconstruct the, the armor as it would have been in this time? And to a reasonable degree, the answer is yes, although I should note that a lot of the reconstructions that I was, I was doing and that I was working on would not have been possible 10, 20, 30 years ago. This is a case where the archeologists have really made it possible to do what I'm doing. Hmm. And so what are some of those archeological advances that have helped? So there's been, um, there has been an increased emphasis in, for, particular artifact classes in pulling them out and cataloging them. Hmm. The, uh, if I was working 30 years ago, I would have to conclude that there were essentially no Republican era Roman swords or that if there were, we didn't know about it, but debates about the nature of the, of the Roman gladius and the Republican period has resulted in a lot of people both finding them. This is one thing I, I ran into uh, often digging in museums was more profitable than digging in the ground. <laughs> that in many cases, objects that are in fact very interesting have been sitting unpublished, unnoticed, undiscussed in museum collections in some <laughs> case for decades. In some cases, quite literally for centuries. <laughs> and so a lot of what I was doing was email after email to, to museums when I became aware that they might have an object. Can I get a picture of it, can I get the provenance information? Where is it from? Has it been published? And then because I needed fairly precise measurements of these things in order to determine, well, how much metal is in that? How much material does it take? Then can you weigh it? Can you measure it? What can you tell me about it? Hmm. Much wrangling with curators, some of whom were more generous with their time than others. Hmm.
So, so really you are kind of going beyond in a lot of ways and, and having a, an adventure in your own, if you want to call it that, an adventure, <laughs> looking at archive and archive and museum and archaeological finds and all to get these artifacts. But you have to have uh, an enormous amount of imagination as well. Can you talk about the visualizing history? Because in popular culture, it seems Rome is enormously popular for visualizations for pop culture visualizations and even in modern European history uh, how, did, how did you sort of contend with some of those pop culture visualizations that are out there and at the same time keep a fresh perspective yourself I think the key is to remain focused on on the evidence I was very skeptical throughout on the sort of artistic reconstructions reenactment reconstructions that you see they're often interpolating and sometimes interpolating wrong. Um, you really have to remain focused on artwork from the period, objects from the period, and stay rooted in that. In some cases, uh, I did actually uh, with, I have a, a friend who does material science engineering who helps me with this. Uh, in some cases, I actually 3D modeled some of these hmm. objects where you would get here is here is the rusted out hulk of what had been a sword. And if I want to work with that, I need to figure out what it would have been like when it was new. We used computer modeling to simulate what a sort of complete unrusted uh, sword would have looked like. And then we could ask things like, well, then how heavy would it be? How much iron would it take? And so on. Hmm. I think, uh, you know, it's interesting, depending on where you look, the quality of, of visualization for the ancient world is actually often quite high. Mm -hmm. I think part of this is that, of course, the Greek and Roman world leave us such wonderful artwork, and there's just a tremendous amount of interest. And I think, I think a, lot of that, a lot of that effort is fantastic. As a historian, you want to be careful because, of course, it's very tempting to see those as sources. They are, they are not, mm -hmm. right? They are products, and they can be flawed. Hmm. Uh, now, you reconstructed a lot of these uh, different items, at least in your mind, or 3D. You did multiple sort of ways of looking at multiple objects, and you had to somehow arrive at this question of costs of war. Um, <laughs> how, how does one make that connection beyond just measuring iron? What does it mean if, if a sword weighed this much? So... I think that's an interesting question. Uh, I started from the supposition that uh, iron, actually metal, is particularly important. We don't think about it this way because we have cheap metal all around us all the time. But worked metal in the ancient world was expensive by its nature. Producing an object of forged iron took time and expertise and truly eye-popping quantities of, of fuel uh, for smelting and forging, and that made almost any iron object, especially something that would need to be as finely crafted as a sword or armor, uh, precious. Of course, the same is true of, of objects in bronze or other copper alloy. And it's especially notable in the ancient world because, particularly for the Romans, these items are being purchased by the common soldier in this period. And that's actually what drew me in part to this project. I have a real fascination with trying to reach the kinds of people that the ancient sources aren't very interested in talking about. Hmm. And of course, our ancient sources are dominated by elite voices to the near total exclusion of everyone else. They are very interested in talking about the general and the decisions he made and profoundly uninterested in talking about the common soldier and the decisions that he made. In the Roman military system in the Republic, uh, the soldiery, the common legionaries are drafted sort of farmers, reasonably well-to-do farmers, but we're still talking about subsistence farmers, well enough to do that they can purchase their own equipment, and they do. And so that made equipment a very interesting question for me to get at what what does it mean if this given group is purchasing more expensive equipment than that group and why? And sort of the blockbuster conclusion that I came to was that uh, 
the Roman soldier is purchasing more and more expensive equipment than almost any of his peers, which is really quite interesting. The traditional view of Roman expansion in this period is that Rome is successful because it is willing to expend large numbers of troops. It's willing to throw people away. It's often phrased very bloodlessly that its advantage is in manpower. Mm. Uh, one scholar put it as horde upon uncomplaining horde of Italian peasants. Oh. But this gives the sense that Roman soldiers are cheap and that Rome's advantage is that it just had more of them. And the Romans do appear to have had more of them. What was interesting is that what it turned out is that they were not cheap, that these men are in fact uh, acquiring a lot more equipment. Uh, their nearest peers uh, are the soldiers of the various successor states of Alexander and the average Roman brings about 25% more weight in metal onto the battlefield with him than a Macedonian peer. And the gap between, say, a Roman and a Carthaginian or even a Roman and a Gaul is even larger. Can we just uh, pause for a second and go back to this idea? Um, I, I think it might be surprising to some. Uh, I mean, it's certainly surprising to me that we have these these farmers buying their own gear and and going to war for the republic. Um, yes. Wait, is this a standard sort of thing? And uh, are these just badass farmers, or are they forced to? What is the deal here? So this is something I, I get into quite a bit because after I do all of this comparison, I'm very interested in how, what mobilization systems result in this kind of output. Mm. So the Roman mobilization system, so these farmers are the citizenry. They make up the largest class of voters in the Roman assemblies. Uh, the Roman, the Republic has voting assemblies. This is not one man, one vote. The assemblies are specifically calibrated to privilege the votes of the wealthy over the votes of the poor, something the Romans brag about. They're very open about this. <laughs> um, Cicero says it's, that's the point. Hmm. Um, but the, the single largest block of votes in the Roman assemblies and the committee, what's called the Committee of Centuriata, the primary Roman assembly, is for the people who, because of their wealth, make up the heavy infantry. That in the Roman system, the very poor might fight as light infantry or might not be required to fight at all. The very rich fight as cavalry and the sort of broad, uh, we might say small farmer, they fight as the heavy infantry because they can afford the basics of this equipment. Hmm. And participation in war is deeply wrapped up both in civic participation. You vote because you fight and you fight because you vote. And it's also deeply wrapped up in gendered values of what a Roman citizen male does. That participation in war is a phase of life for, for your average Roman small freeholding farmer. Uh, Roman family formation patterns have altered to reflect this reality. Roman men seem to get married into their 30s when they're less likely to be drafted because they will have spent most of their 20s in the army. Hmm. I think the average, the average Roman is going to spend something like seven or eight years in the army just looking at how many soldiers the Romans draft versus how many Romans would have been liable for conscription. <laughs> uh, you remain, as a side note, you remain liable for conscription into your 50s. Oh, wow. But the Romans tend to prefer to draft late teens, early 20s, and sort of spread out from there in the age categories as necessary. Uh, and it's worth noting the other thing, Rome, like all of its neighbors in Italy, expects to be at war all the time. Mm. Uh, there are, the Roman Republic stands for about 500 years. They are at peace for six of them. <laughs> And this was just, Rome is not unique in this sense. This was the military environment of Italy that Rome grew up in. But it means that they are continuously processing their sort of freeholding farmer population 
through the army in, in a regular sort of way so that this is an experience that all Romans have. And so it becomes a sort of expectation as a Roman man, this is what you do. And I should note that is also true for most of the other communities in Italy that Rome is initially competing with. By the time I start looking at Rome, Rome has conquered the rest of Italy. Uh, you know, the sort of final phase of that is in the 270s. Rome runs on what I, what I joke to my students is that I call the Goku model of imperialism. I beat you, therefore we are now friends. <laughs> so what Rome has done as it has expanded through Italy is that as communities fall in, under Rome's sway, either because they ally with Rome against their local rivals or because they are then beaten by Rome for being the rival of Rome's new ally, Rome incorporates them into a sort of tiered system of subordinate communities the Romans euphemistically call the allies, the mm. Sukii. Allies here needs sort of quotes around it. The Romans are using this to avoid hurting anyone's feelings. These are subject communities. Becoming an ally of Rome means that you give up all foreign policy, except that you have an a, alliance with Rome that is not equal. Rome makes all of your foreign policy decisions for you. And when the Roman army is called up, you have to send your detachment to go fight with them, which the Roman army is called up every year. <laughs> Now, the upside is that Rome generally doesn't interfere with your internal affairs, and the Romans do not tax you. Hmm. What they want from you is your military strength, which if you want to think about it this way, uh, after Rome mugs you, takes away a lot of your wealth and some of your land, and then incorporates you into their predatory gang, they don't need to tax you. They're going to use your manpower to mug the next person. Hmm. And this is where that previous thesis came of just sending these uh, people, these expendable troops. Right. And every, well, and this is where Roman manpower comes from. Only half of the army, sometimes less than half of the army are Roman. The mm. remainder are the Sokii who having grown up in the same tough neighborhood military environment that the Romans have, have the same sort of hardened military institutions that the Romans have. Mm. So they, plug right in. The Sokii fight the same way the Romans do, with the same weapons, so far as we can tell, and the same equipment. They are tactically interchangeable. Hmm. And the question then becomes, how do you extract resources in an environment like this? And the answer loops around to what I was saying before, that military participation, military service, is both a part of these men, their civic identity and their masculine identity, their citizen identity, that to be a man of substance and meaning, not only at Rome, but also in these uh, Italian communities that are under Rome, means to have a polished military service record, to have been out on campaign, to have been successful. If you want to run for a uh, local office, it means to have been in leadership positions in the military. Hmm. Uh, running for any kind of significant office in Rome required 10 years service in the army in order to be eligible. So you had to, you had to have done this. And in that context, how does Rome raise these armies? And the answer is they ask politely. <laughs> and when they're asking uh, these people, uh, when they're raising these armies, what what does a deployment look like? Where are they going? I sure it depends on the war, but uh, could it be anywhere? It could be anywhere. <laughs> so one of the th one of the things that Rome is learning to cope with in the period I study is deployments that are far outside of Italy. That mm. Rome's wars prior to this had been contained entirely in Italy, uh, with either with other Italian communities or with enemies that, as it were, had come to the Romans. 264 marks the start of something different. Rome gets involved in a war in Sicily. It's overseas. Now, overseas here in quotes, hmm. um, you know, that you can cross the strait in a rowboat. Hmm. And the Romans do. They don't have a navy of much note at the start of the war. They have a small navy at the start of the war, uh, much smaller than their opponent, which is Carthage. Carthage is the other power on Sicily. And Rome is 
drawn and pushes into progressively more foreign wars such that by the end of this period, Rome is operating military forces simultaneously on three continents, that they'll have simultaneous military operations in, on, in Anatolia, in North Africa, in Spain, in Northern Italy and Southern France, all at the same time. Uh, in part, this is driven by the needs of the Roman aristocracy. Uh, you need a good record of military service to get into public office, but to continue to climb the ladder of politics to its dizzying heights at Rome, you need the command of armies, and then you need military success, which means that Roman aristocrats are continually looking for opportunities. They're, they're spoiling for a fight. Hmm. And so Rome is very bellicose, though uh, it's worth noting Rome is very bellicose and aggressive, but so is literally every other state in the ancient Mediterranean. Mm. It's a rough neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, but so this is what they are doing, and Rome deploys absolutely staggering amounts of manpower and resources in these continuous wars. Uh, the single largest Roman deployments come in the sort of in the dark days of Rome's second war with Carthage. This is, many people will be familiar, Hannibal coming over the Alps and destroying several Roman armies very dramatically. Uh, Hannibal's last great victory is in 216 uh, at Cannae, but Hannibal is going to stay in Italy for uh, more than a decade afterwards, raiding and tearing the place up. Hmm. But in the aftermath of that colossal defeat, the largest army the Romans had probably ever lost, by the end of that year, they seem to have something around 200,000 men under arms. Mm. They have an army in northern Italy, an army in southern Italy, an army in Sicily, and an army in Spain. And so their mobilization system has allowed them to make these absolutely tremendous demands in manpower and resources, both on their citizen body and on these subject communities. And that was the question I wanted to investigate. Is it just because Roman soldiers are cheap that they can do this? And then when it became apparent through my research that Roman soldiers were actually not cheap at all, they were expensive. Hmm. Then by what system do they get here? And the answer is that they rely very heavily on Italian social institutions and even the sort of light hand of diplomacy. Uh, I find it striking, for instance, the Romans have words. They have ways of phrasing states that are subordinate. They never use these for the Italian allies. The Italians are always allies. They're never clients. They're never subjected. The contrast from how the Greeks tend to talk about subject communities is really uh, quite bracing. The Athenians talked about their empire as the cities which the Athenians now rule. Hmm. Uh, this doesn't mean that all of the allies were happy with the arrangement. Hannibal comes over the Alps and somewhere between a third and half of the Roman allies switch sides. Wow. One of the things I'm thinking of as you're saying this, the social institutes, um, it just, this just jogged a memory from my undergrad days. I was reading about the copious amounts of wine that were imbibed in uh, ancient Rome. Um, was that part of this return from these wars? How could a soldier sort of go back to life? What was that social fabric of, of returning from war? So there's a lively debate about this. There is vanishingly little evidence in the ancient sources for anything we might call PTSD. Hmm. There are the standard examples. There is the fellow in Herodotus at the Battle of Marathon who is struck with what uh, these days I think we would call, I think the phrase is still, it's sort of awkward hysterical blindness that there's nothing biologically wrong with the eyes, but it's a, a mental problem and the person can truly no longer see. Hmm. Uh, but there are very few examples of this. And I think there has been a lot of debate as to why that is. Uh, I don't know that I'm fully qualified to weigh in. The one thing that I would note is that it's important to remember that the experience of war and blood and death for the Romans was normal. War was not an aberration. Killing was not an aberration. Being in the Roman army was simply something that happened to you 
uh, like going to high school or getting a driver's license. Hmm. This was just something you did, and it was something your society valued. And if you saw horrible things, well, your society is telling you that those were, in fact, excellent and tremendous things. Those were valuable things, and hmm. that you should, you should praise those things. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that we often encounter the individuals coping with the memory and experience of violence in a society where the vast majority of people have not experienced those things. But a Roman coming back from war is coming back into a society where everyone has experienced those things. Hmm. His experiences aren't different. His father, his uncles, his friends, his cousins, his social circle, uh, they have all experienced that too. And so how much is the identity then tied to these family or village units versus a sort of like Roman identity? If they come back and say, hey guys, actually I joined uh, this other great team. I'm now supporting Hannibal. Let's hope he doesn't destroy our village. Uh, like like how is, is that even outrageous or is it is it just family identities town identities or is there a concept of rome so there is a so there is a concept of rome it's worth noting here that there are there are key divisions mm. no roman citizen community sides with hannibal not one uh. uh the allies that flip sides are the socii this is this is capua this is tarentum of course i'm saying these i don't have the list in front of me of who exactly flips sides. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and these communities in, in the late third century, they don't regard themselves as Roman. They're wow. allies with Rome, but they're distinct. They're Capuans. They have Capuan citizenship. And they may have some preferred legal status at Rome. Um, Rome has sort of tiers of legal status that you can have. And so you can have Latin rights, which amusingly by this point, None of the Latins have Latin rights. They all have some kind of, of citizenship. But the Romans will then upgrade other communities to Latin rights to, for instance, recognize them for contributions in, to Rome. And that might give you some sort of special legal access at Rome. It might give you the ability to marry Roman citizens. But it, it doesn't change the fact that you are a Capuan and that is how you see yourself. You are not a Roman. And what really that's only that's only going to change in the first century BC. Hmm. So Rome is very much a single community leading a, a very unequal alliance of a bunch of different communities and navigating those identities. When Roman citizenship is expanded over the rest of Italy. What we see, at least initially, is a strong indication that what you have is identities get layered. And that remains true for the Roman Empire. Roman citizenship is, for the ancient world, radically expansionary. Uh, whereas Greek citizenship, to be a citizen in a Greek uh, polis, a Greek city-state, you have to have a citizen father and a citizen mother, and there's no way in. The mm -hmm. Romans, there are actually quite a number of ways to get Roman citizenship. And the number of Roman citizens expand. And we see throughout the Roman world that this produces a sort of layered identity where an individual is now, they're definitely, they consider themselves Roman. They also consider themselves these other things. Uh, one example, jumping to the period of, of the empire, jumping to the second century CE, that I love to use when teaching, are mummy portraits that come out of Egypt. This is a... A burial custom, the individual is buried with a little um, wood slat, painted wood slat with a picture of the deceased on it. This is a distinctively Egyptian burial custom. The Romans do not do this. Hmm. But what we see as uh, Roman citizenship is, is penetrating the area is you will start to see, you see mummy portraits where an individual has represented himself in the there's a very distinctive garb for the roman citizen of the tunic and toga with the purple stripe and this is standing up and shouting i am a roman citizen mm. at the top of your lungs and what's interesting these are not transplant 
you look at these individuals and you can look at the skin color, the hairstyles, often they're, uh, they're buried with their wives who you can look at their dress as well. And of course, this is a family that is advertising its citizen status, but may also be wearing local dress, local hairstyles. They're obviously engaged in a local burial. Their names may not be maybe a mix of Roman and Greek, Roman and Demotic, that these identities are being layered into something that's a lot more complex. So the Roman Empire, as it expands, becomes very diverse. And really, it's better to say that Rome was always very diverse. Even Rome's foundational myths, which date back before we can really talk about this community in a lot of detail, have in them the idea that Rome is a fusion community, a merger of different groups of Italic peoples, some Sabines, some Latins, some Etruscans, even some other groups further afield, that the Roman citizen body is diverse from day one. Hmm. And that does seem to be backed up by the archaeology of the site, which the Roman foundation myths are, to a degree, patriotic nonsense. But what we see in the archaeology of the Roman site is that it seems that several of the seven hills of Rome were inhabited with what were probably separate communities that eventually come together and, and merge. Our first big example of these communities coming together to form a single community is that the swamp, the nasty, yucky swamp that sits between them is drained to make a public space, what is now the Roman Forum. You can go there. <laughs> um, but that these are probably separate communities coming together. And this is something just generally that uh, I think is very important to stress, especially these days, because the Roman Empire sometimes becomes a sort of a, a banner for people who want to insist that it was not diverse. Uh, it mm -hmm. was. It was very diverse. I mean, of course it was. Look how huge it is. Yeah. It, it's... it's uh... The the diversity of the Roman Empire and what you just led into was almost exactly what I was going to ask you next, um, which is the costs of war and studying this ancient civilization. Uh, it must just be tempting to so often uh, want to think of it in a comparative sense or in a modern sense, because war is in the news today almost all the time. Um, and there's some conflict going on somewhere. Uh, can you talk about that? Are there lessons? Uh, is there a big takeaway you can share with us from your work of studying these ancient civilizations? Um, or is this an invaluable or a uh, valuable exercise to compare? Or would you advise people against it? So I think there is, there is value in, in comparison. I think I have two sort of takeaways that both pop into my mind based on your question. The first is sort of very directly in the question of military activity that I think one of the key things that you realize about Roman military activity is that in addition to, I, I described this sort of the Roman pressure for aggression in their political system, but the other thing that is continually happening with the Romans is that you know, we sometimes talk about our forever wars. The Romans are always getting dragged into forever wars. They're going into conflicts that are theoretically supposed to be short and sweet, and they never end up being so. Hmm. Uh, the classic example is that the Romans first really move into Spain in force in 218 BC, and they will be wrapping up military operations in Spain 200 years later. <laughs> under the first emperor Augustus. Some of that is low intensity mountain raiding. Uh, some of it, uh, as uh, Fernando Quesada Sanz has been arguing, I think quite successfully recently, is actually very high intensity pitched battles with the locals. Hmm. And it's a situation where pacifying each region drags the Romans further and further. Now in the Roman mindset, of course, the glory of empire is worth the bloodshed. I think we as moderns can perhaps be maybe a little bit more discerning as to whether the glory of empire was worth 200 years of bitter and often quite bloody conflict. Hmm. The other thing that I would just 
tag as a takeaway for studying the, the Roman world and for my method of studying the Roman world is the importance because the sources can be so seductive Hmm. The importance of trying to get to the people the sources do not talk about. Uh, Robert Knapp phrases these as invisible Romans. Uh, I tend to expand that phrase a little bit and say invisible people. Hmm. That's a, for book recommendations, Invisible Romans is the name of his book. Go read it. <laughs> there we go. Um, <laughs> but because in part, one of the things I do is I look at individuals who are not Romans at all who are in cases fighting the Romans, resisting the Romans. Hmm. The sources that we have, they privilege elite voices, they privilege male voices, they privilege citizen voices, they privilege free voices. And you often have to, as a result, be a lot more creative at getting to what is the experience of the small farmer? What is the experience of a woman in this society? What is the experience of uh, an enslaved person in this society? How are they, in, in my field, how are they impacted by Roman military activity? How are their lives shaped by the decision of Roman elites to go to war again and again for the glory of empire? And in some cases, the answer is positively. Certainly the average Roman small farmer did a lot of fighting in these wars, but also Italy gets rich in these wars. Hmm. Some of those Roman small farmers got rich. Some of them got dead. Yeah. And some of them got poor from being dragged out on military operations repeatedly. And you have to be clever in how you try and get at these people and their experiences because those experiences are real and valid and we should think about them, but they are not often reflected in our sources. I do uh, sometimes economic modeling, uh, demographic modeling. I am enamored of my efforts to, which I'm, I'm still working to, to expand on, to model Roman smallholding farms. Hmm. What, is the, what, are, what is the economic situation of this household like? What strains exist on it? Building on the works of, of scholars like uh, Nate Rosenstein or Paul Erkamp who have done very similar things. Um, yeah. And, and material culture is also a way to look at these people because they may not show up in the sources, but they did have stuff. Yeah. I, I think it's kind of a brilliant message to uh, leave people with because I, I think a lot of times when people are thinking of uh, ancient history, they kind of say, well, well, that's a really limited field. But I mean, anyone who's, who's listening to this podcast, I mean, I, I, I'm not a historian of the ancient world in any sense of the word, but just what you just described there um, I mean, there's tons of work yet to be done and, and tons of relevant work that, that has meaningful crossover to today. Um, as we're drawing to the end here, uh, it's time for one of my favorite parts of the podcast is when you offer a suggestion. Um, before you go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in front of you in line and offer a suggestion, uh, something that popped into my mind, and I'll let you critique this as well. Um, we were talking about video games before we started recording and my one of my favorite video games that I suggest was uh, the Total War series. Uh, it's so Rome Total War and Shogun Total War. One thing, if they don't teach the proper history, they do teach geography fairly well. And I've had a lot of students who just know place names, like they would be able to visualize all the places that you said today if they had played Rome Total War. So if nothing else, they're great uh, teachers of geography. And so I suggest those <laughs> video games. Spend some time on, on there and, and you will learn your world. Um, what, what do you have for us? Well, just to add on to that, and if you have the patience for something perhaps even a little bit more complex, uh, check out some of uh, Paradox Interactive's titles like Europa Universalis or Crusader mm, King. Yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously, I actually think that games like that can be interesting, interesting tools to think about the past because there is there are insights you can gain by being in the position of having to make decisions. Hmm. Uh, obviously those insights can be limited by, you know, how accurate is this as a simulation? But, but even, even still some of the 
questions you have to raise and some of the ways you have to think about problems when you're faced with real historical uh, situations, however abstracted they may be, can be really valuable in thinking about in thinking about these questions. Hmm. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of my recommendations, um, if people are interested for you know, they work in a field that doesn't use material culture very much, or they haven't used material culture, and they want it sort of a quick, what can it do? Uh, uh, Brian Ward Perkins's The Fall of Rome and the End of Civilization uh, is a few years old now, but um, is a good, this is a, a historical problem I think most people will be familiar with. It is, how bad was the fall of Rome? Hmm. And he, he goes at it with an archaeological material culture approach and opens up a very different window talking about how does, how does nutrition change? How does access to consumer goods change? How does the size and uh, nutrition of cows change? Hmm. Uh, and the answer is the cows get smaller. Hmm. Uh, how do trade networks change? And these sorts of questions, which the sources provide us no tools with which to answer, but archaeology can start to, to help us answer and to ask, okay, what was the experience of being a common person as the Roman Empire is collapsing around you? What was that like? And it's a good example of, of some of the benefits that can come out of, out of a material culture approach. Very cool. Well, it, it's been a pleasure. I've certainly learned a lot about ancient Rome, and I'm looking forward to see um, see what you do with this uh, fascinating dissertation and your future work. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add before we sign off here? Uh, I suppose if people are, are interested in my less formal musings, I <laughs> do have a weekly uh, web blog that uh, I keep updated. Uh, you can Google it. It's a collection of unmitigated pedantry. Perfect. That is the title. Uh, and they can check that out. Um, Great. And and we will have links to that as uh, always on hourofhistory.com. Well, uh, Dr. Brett Devereaux, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, another great episode of the Hour of History podcast. On Hour of History, it's our world anytime, any place. Thanks for listening. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out our recommendations page at hourofhistory.com forward slash rex. That's hourofhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. There you'll find links to the books mentioned during the podcast. And if you choose to purchase one, you'll be supporting the podcast in the process. And if you still haven't gotten your fill of the Hour of History, make sure you head over to the Hour of History blog found at hourofhistory.com forward slash blog with articles being released fairly often on topics relating to those covered in the podcast as well as others. With that, we conclude this episode and hope to have you back for the next one. Take care. And again, thanks for listening to the Hour of History podcast.